Man, if you uh, were not with us last week, you may not know this, but we introduced our vision for Revive Church in a new learning series called Not Just One. Everybody say, Not Just One. Not say it again. Say, Not Just One. Not just one. We introduced this new vision to see a place where no one feels like just one. This is our vision for the church. We want no one to feel like just one. We believe that when you come to church, you should not feel like you are alone. And we've said this for years now, that church can either be the loneliest place in the world or it can be the most relational place. And so when we opened up last week, um, there was some heat from this. It was sizzling. It was spicy. If you haven't watched this on YouTube, you need to, uh, because it will be convicting, definitely. But this vision to see a place where no one feels like just one, and we said that there are two things that we're going to adopt as a church. The first one is this. We're going to invite our unsaved, unchurched friends and family to revive. We believe that if you're going to be a part of Revive Church, there should be several Sundays through the year where there is someone sitting beside you that is a first-time guest that does not know Jesus. We believe that that should be a part of our culture. The second thing we're doing is we're offering small groups, and Shane talked about this a little bit, but small groups are the way that you can connect with other people in the church. Small groups are the way that you find relationships, you find friendships, it's a way that you can connect. Now, I've been doing this long enough to know that last week's message rubbed some people the wrong way. I know that there are some people who were offended by last week, you're welcome. Um, but I wanna unapologetically say that this vision stands as it is, that we want to see a place where no one feels like just one, where people are welcome and where people are offered the love of Jesus. Now, last week we talked all about the why, why we are doing this, and I went in deep into the why, but today I wanna build on the why with how. How are we going to do this? Because our mission at Revive Church is we exist to introduce real people to the real Jesus. Our vision is to see a place where no one feels like just one. But when you say those two things, sometimes there are people who have voices that become very, very loud above the vision, very, very loud above the purpose. They're what I call wall builders. Everybody say wall builders. There's two types of wall builders whenever you introduce a vision or a mission like we have to introduce real people to the real Jesus, to create a place, to see a place where no one feels like just one. One where we want to see sinners, unsaved, unchurched friends and family be able to come into the house of God and experience the love of Jesus, know who Jesus is, and not just true, not just grace, but also truth, not just truth, but also grace, both combine together. But there's two types of wall builders that show up. The first is the type of person who builds walls from condemnation. They build walls from condemnation. When you talk about loving people, when you talk about introducing them to the real Jesus, they have built up a wall from condemnation. And they stand behind this wall isolated and they start yelling out at you. Don't believe what the church says, they're full of lies. They said they love me, but they didn't. They'll love you as long as you're a Republican. They'll love you as long as you do exactly what they say. They'll say that they care about you, but then they try to do behavior modification. They're not trustworthy. And they stand behind their wall, isolated, build these walls from condemnation because maybe they were rejected by a church. Maybe they were rejected by people. Let me tell you the, the truth about the church. The church will always remain flawed until Jesus comes again because the church is made up of y'all. And we are all flawed people. We have these dents in us. Now, because of the grace of God, because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he died and rose again, we do have the Holy Spirit. He is transforming us absolutely, but we will never see perfection in this life. And so the church, full of human beings, sometimes can hurt people. And I want to tell you, if you believe that you were hurt by the church, that's a lie that someone told you. You have never been hurt by the church because the church is what's called the body of Christ. The church is Jesus. What you were hurt by were hurt people. 
And so before you get mad at God and build a wall from condemnation and say, I don't want anything to do with God, anything to do with Jesus, because all those Jesus followers are fake, just remember, people hurt you, not Jesus. But there's a second type of wall builder, the people who scream at the top of their lungs, build that wall. It's the people who build walls for condemnation. It's the people who, when they hear the message to introduce real people to the real Jesus, they have this vision that no one would feel like just one. They have built a wall for condemnation, and they stand behind their wall, and they go, no, don't let those sinners in. If you let the sinners into the church, they'll corrupt the next generation. The church looks too much like culture. This should not be the way it is. The church is sanctified and holy. How dare you let those heathens into holy ground? And they isolate themselves behind their walls, and they scream from the top of their lungs. They build walls for condemnation. They want people to know what they stand against rather than what they stand for. And in these two types of wall builders, the Bible says something very clearly in Proverbs 18.1. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. The Bible's letting us know that when we build walls to isolate ourselves from other people, from God, it is rooted in selfishness. Oh, this might hurt. It's going to sting, but it's okay. When you build walls around yourself to isolate yourself from other people, from Christianity, from Jesus, from your friends, from your neighbors, it is rooted in selfishness. It's a selfish act. And the Bible says he breaks out against all sound judgment. One commentary on Proverbs 18.1 said this, you make yourself so opinionated and conceited that you become ridiculous and are vexatious to others. Vexatious is your fancy word for the day. Use it at your next cocktail party. Vexatious means that you have to argue with someone when somebody brings up something that you disagree with. You begin to say outrageous, exaggerated statements to sound confident. And when people present you with sound judgment, or the Bible, an elevated translation of Proverbs 18.1 says, people present you with godly wisdom, you immediately strike back from behind your wall. You have built a wall of isolation. Here's the thing. I believe that God wants us to show grace. I believe that God wants us to love people. I believe that God wants us to show people who the real Jesus actually is. I believe that God wants us to show love to the sinner. First, because that's who you were before you found Jesus. And secondly, because that is the heart of God. But the question then is, if we are going to open our walls up, if we are going to love people regardless of their sinfulness or their state of depravity, if we're going to love people whether or not they are in lockdown, been in lockdown, if we're going to love the addict, if we're going to love the people who disagree with us, how do we open our arms and have a vision to see a place where no one feels like just one, where everyone is in community, how do we do that without compromising our values? How do I do that without compromising my morals, my beliefs? That's a great question. And ultimately, that's what starts with the people who build walls for condemnation. Their original intent was, I want to protect my morals, my values, but what ended up happening is they built a wall for condemnation so they could isolate themselves and solidify themselves in their own ideologies and opinions. They become conceited with righteousness, and they begin to shoot it back out and throw stones from behind their walls. We have a wall called social media. If you don't say it to my face, you're a coward. If all you do is say it on social media, but you can't say it straight to my face, you have built a wall. I'm going to get some good amens on this today. Because people who build walls, they like to say, but doesn't the Bible say in 1 Corinthians 15, bad company corrupts good character? And yes, you're absolutely right. But did you know that when you study out 1 Corinthians 15, 33, that Paul, the guy who actually wrote this book of the Bible, he was quoting a secular Greek poet? 
This isn't the Bible. Bad company corrupts good character was actually from a Grecian poem. (laughs) And the bad company that he was referring to were the Greek philosophers and the religious leaders who were denying the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. He was letting the church know, be careful how engaged you become with this people because the same people who built walls for themselves are the same people who are attacking you with, tr- with things that are not true and they are trying to get you to believe that Jesus did not raise up from the dead. Another passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians, go figure, that Christians love to throw is do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This is what we used in youth group when I was a student, whenever they found out that you were dating somebody that didn't go to your church. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. How dare you date someone who does not go to our church? And you're correct. I understand that mentality. We use that as a tool to disengage and isolate ourselves from people. But when you read through the whole book of 2 Corinthians, you find that Paul was talking directly to the act of making alliances with people that were inconsistent in their faith. And it was so to the point that the the Corinthian church were in such an alliance with people that they were wavering in their own faith. They would worship the God of the Israelites on Sunday. They would worship the Jesus that they had put their faith in on Sunday, but then they would go to the other temples of the false idols and they would offer sacrifices to the false gods just because they wanted to fit in. And so what Paul is saying here is he says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I used to, meant, used to think that this meant don't be unequally yoked side to side. So don't walk with somebody who's down here and you're up here. What I've learned, though, as I've progressed in my faith is don't be unequally yoked means don't be yoked together with someone who is leading you into false truth. You have to learn to lead because you are firm in your faith. In other words, when you put a a yoke of oxen together, they weren't just side by side. The two strongest were in the front and the weakest were in the back. Because if the strong ones are in the back and the weak ones are in the front, the strong demolish the weak ones. So if you're weak in your faith and you're engaged in relationship with people who are trying to commit to you that what you believe is not true, guess what happens? They walk all over you and then you become this person who goes, I don't know what I actually believe. Now that I've broken apart your theology, (laughs) let's answer this question. How do I effectively connect with those who don't know Jesus in a healthy way? How do I effectively connect with those who don't know Jesus in a healthy way? The answer is very clear. Stop building walls and start creating boundaries. Stop building walls and start creating boundaries. Boundaries are so much more effective because boundaries are designed to where I can still see you, communicate with you, and have interaction with you. You may not cross this boundary in my life, and we're going to talk about what these boundaries look like, but I can still see you, I can still engage with you, and here's even even better. When you're hurting, I can still reach across and hug you. (laughs) I still have interaction with you. Boundaries are designed so that whoever is in the relationship with one another are protected, not punished. Boundaries are allow both people in a relationship to be protected rather than punished. This is why small groups are so important in Revived Church. We believe that we are a church of small groups, not a church with small groups. Because we believe that every single person who becomes a part of the church who says, I want to get connected, they need to be in some kind of small group. They need to be connected with other people. Because when you're in a small group, there are boundaries set up to protect you and not punish you. Because maybe you've been to the church that felt like you were being punished all the time. That's not what small groups are about. It's about connecting with you and protecting you. We see this in the Bible, even from Genesis 1. In the very beginning of the Bible, this is the element of creation that we believe as followers of Jesus, that in Genesis 1, we see this account of creation where God creates everything. And in verse 3, here's what he says, let there be light, and there was light. We believe that by faith. And God saw the light that it was good. And here's where God institutes boundaries. He says, it says, God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. 
Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. I practiced that word firmament over and over and over. (laughs) And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. And here's what God did. God said, let there be light. And before he let light run rampant around the universe, he put a boundary in place that light would be separated from the darkness. He called the light day. He called the night dark. There's three elements for healthy boundaries in our relationships that I see clearly that God instituted in creation and need to be in our lives. Boundaries for them to be healthy have to be created, clarified, and communicated. They have to be created, clarified, and communicated. I want to communicate something to you. You need to be taking notes on this. The reason why your life feels like a mess is because it is. And the reason why your life is a mess is because you have not implemented healthy boundaries. I'm smiling because I want to sound nice when I say this. (laughs) But it's true. A lot of the mess that we live just simply has to do with because we have not created healthy boundaries. We've isolated ourselves and build walls. You need to be taking notes on this, on your phone, on your iPad, on your uh, crappy Android, I'm sorry, Android device. Um, However you wanna do, maybe you wanna write it old school with a pen, but you need to write this down because this is what's going to help you. Boundaries have to be created. Boundaries don't just happen, you create them. They have to be clarified. Boundaries begin and end where you tell them to begin and end, and boundaries have to be communicated. If you're the only one who knows about your boundaries, don't expect other people to respect your boundaries. You have to create boundaries, clarify boundaries, and communicate boundaries. Now, in my relationship with others, especially as a pastor, I have had to implement boundaries. I've had to create boundaries, clarify boundaries, and communicate boundaries. And today what I want to do is I want to close out by offering you six key areas where boundaries are needed in your life to remain spiritually healthy as we fulfill the vision of Revive Church. As we fulfill the vision and the purpose to introduce real people to the real Jesus by seeing a place, creating an environment where no one feels like just one, here's how we're going to do this. We have to have six key areas in our life with boundaries. The first key area is this. You have to have a boundary around your faith. You have to have a boundary around your faith, what you believe. In 1 Corinthians 16, the author Paul, he says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Now, most people think they do that. The people who have built walls for condemnation, that's what they believe they do. They think they're firm in their faith. They yell out scriptures. They post scriptures on Facebook and they're kicking the keyboard like this while they do it because they want you to know that they believe in righteousness and holiness and the sanctification of the Holy Spirit and blah, 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 blah. But the problem is they got to verse 13, but they never read verse 14. Do everything in love. See, you can stand firm in your faith and do everything in love if you have boundaries around your faith. What I've learned is the people who shout their faith the loudest usually don't believe in what they're shouting. The people who have to hold picket signs outside of people's funerals that say things like, God hates fags and burn in hell, What I've learned is they don't actually believe that. They are the most insecure people in their faith. They don't know what they believe. What they know is what they were taught. What they know is what was shoved down their throat as a child. What they know is what they've been manipulated by, but they don't actually know what they believe. See, I'm firm in my faith. I know what I believe. I'm going to give you just some things that I believe as a follower of Jesus. And you don't have to believe these, by the way, to be a part of Revive Church right now. You are welcome here anytime. But I just want to very clearly communicate the, the boundaries of our faith in this church. We believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. We, don't, we, we just believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe that he was born of a virgin named Mary, a little teenage girl who didn't know what was about to happen. We believe that she was married to Joseph. We believe that Jesus had no earthly father, but he had a heavenly father. We believe that Jesus spent 30 years of his life preparing himself for what God called him to do, and in three and a half years, he had a ministry that impacted the entire generation of Israel and the future people of the world. We believe that he died on a cross for our 
sins. We believe that we deserve death, but he took it for us. We believe that he was put into a grave, and as he prophesied over himself, he spent three days, his dead body, in that grave, but he came out after the third day. We believe that he was resurrected from the dead, and it was the greatest miracle of all time, because when he walked the earth, he began to minister to people about his resurrection. We believe that he was ascended back into heaven, and he now sits at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. We believe that while Jesus is up in heaven, he also sent his Holy Spirit down to earth. I believe that the Holy Spirit resides in me, that I have a transformative power in me. I believe that every single day, because of the grace of the Holy Spirit, I'm becoming just like Jesus. I'm not looking just like him. I'm not acting just like him, but I have the spirit inside of me that's giving me the the same desires that Jesus had. We believe these things. I'm firm in my faith. So here's what that means. When I have a conversation with someone who doesn't believe just like I do, I never have to argue with them because I have a boundary around my faith. I know I am firm in what I believe. My hairstylist, a guy named Bruce, great guy. I hope one day he comes to church, finds Jesus. Around Easter time, he was cutting my hair because I had to get my hair fresh for Easter. And um, we're sitting there and we're talking and, and he asked me, you know, are you doing anything for Easter? Because he has several clients and I'm, and I'm sure they were all talking about Easter at church. And he said, are you doing anything for Easter? I said, yeah, our church is doing a big Easter egg hunt and I invited him out. You know, bring your kids out. He goes, oh, I'd love to, but uh, we have something at Temple. Now he's an openly practice, well, practicing Buddhist. He, he's he's kind of like some of y'all. He shows up occasionally, but he's not really into it. So, um, br- spurn. And... Uh, so he, he, he's kind of Buddhist, kind of not, but his wife is very involved in temples, what he was telling me, and his kids are heavily involved. His wife takes the kids out, and I said, why don't you go all the time? He goes, I like football too much. And so um, he was telling me that when they go out on Sundays, that the kids help set up the temple, and they know the priests, and, and uh, they engage in all the practices of, of the Buddhist beliefs. And so I've studied Buddhism before, and so I know a lot of key things of these. And so I was asking him questions about his beliefs. And so as I'm asking these questions about Buddhist beliefs, it was really interesting because for a practicing Buddhist, he didn't know much about Buddhism. But uh, one of the things that caught me is as I was asking him these questions, out of nowhere, he asked me this question, what do you believe about Jesus? I mean, he just cut my hair, y'all. <laughs> what do you believe about Jesus? I said, that's a great question, Bruce. I said, well, you know, we believe that Jesus was the, the son of God, that he was born to a virgin. And just like I just said, just a real quick conversation. I didn't preach it like I just did. I was just having a conversation. We believe Jesus died for our sins. And so he starts asking me questions of things that Christian clients that he had had asked him. They were preposterous. They were people who had never read their Bible, obviously. And so I'm trying to clear this stuff up. And here's the thing. As he asked me more about Jesus, guess what I did? I asked him more about Buddhism. As he asked me more about Christianity, I asked him more about Buddhism. Why did I do that? Because I was clearly defining for him, I have a boundary of faith around me, and I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And when I asked him about Buddhism, he would tell me, eh, not really into it, and I'd begin to share with him, you know, if you knew Jesus, it would change your life. Now, here's the thing. Over the course of that 30, 40 minutes that he was cutting my hair, because it has to be perfect, I desire perfection with my hair, (laughs) we never once argued with each other. Not once. He never said, I don't believe that. I never once swiped the scissors out of his hand and said, do not touch me, you demonic Buddhist worshiper. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Hair, grow back. I rebuke this hair. (laughs) Didn't do that once. We had an open conversation about our beliefs. And the reason why I wasn't agitated, the reason why I was not angry with him, the reason why I didn't have to lash out, the reason why I didn't get on his Facebook account and start pushing scriptures on his Facebook account so that he would read them is because I have a boundary around my faith. I can stand firm in my faith and love people while I present Jesus. The second thing though is I also have to have a boundary around my identity. Romans 8.1 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I've set a boundary around my identity. You cannot convince me that I am anything other than a sinner who was saved by grace, and now I am a child of God, holy and sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot convince me that I am going to hell because I know that Jesus paid the price for my salvation. I know that I belong to him. I know I am a man of God. 
God, not a punk of God. I know what I believe. I know that God has saved me. He has called me. So when you try to bring up my sins of the past and you try to condemn me and say you still need to pay the spiritual price for those sins, I know that Romans 8, 1 says that because I am in Christ Jesus, I don't have to suffer condemnation anymore. I don't have to feel guilt or shame for my past sins because I have been forgiven past, present, and future. I know what my identity is. The problem with a lot of people is we have not put boundaries around our identity so when other people present who we believe they, that we are, we tend to agree with them. The biggest cultural issue we're facing in America and even around the world today is not belief in Jesus, it's belief in who Jesus says we are. It's an issue of identity. I can bring up so many different identity crisis that people are going through right now. But here's the thing, because I put a boundary around my identity, you can't tell me anything other than what I am. And if you try to, it bounces off. I can have an open, honest conversation, though, about who I believe I am. The third thing is I have to have a boundary around my calling. I'm going to tell you something that may or may not blow your mind. You're not called to everyone. You are not called to tell everyone about Jesus but you are called to someone. And I think the problem that as followers of Jesus we have is if we don't have boundaries around our calling, guess what happens? Anytime somebody talks about planting a church, we go plant a church. Anytime somebody says, you need to quit that job because it's full of sinners, we go, oh my gosh, you're right, I need to work in a holy environment. You hear a missionary talk about the deepest, darkest parts of Africa, how there are unknown tribes that don't know Jesus. And I'm like, if they're unknown, how do you know they're there? <laughs> and how if you, if you really, really cared about those people, then you would quit your job and come with me to minister to these people in the deep, dark African tribes. They need to know Jesus too. And guess what happens? You quit your job. You leave your family. You show up on day one and they kill you because they don't know you, white man. I know it's kind of humorous, but the truth is that just happened recently to a young man. He did not know the boundary around his calling. Someone convinced him to go to a tribe that had never been reached with the gospel. He showed up on day one, and they executed him. Now it becomes a little bit more serious. But can I tell you, what if God had called you to the people who you have a realm of influence with today? What if the reason you're at that crappy job is not because Satan put you there, but because God ordained you to be there, because there are people who need to know Jesus there, and you're the only Jesus that they're going to know about. I know the job asks for more hours than you're willing to work. I know your boss is a big grump. Maybe your boss is a grump because they don't know Jesus yet. So you are called to somebody, but you're not called to everybody. This is now my boundary for my calling. I know that as a white young man, I was called to plant a church in central Arlington. No one is called to plant a church in central Arlington. If you come to me and say, I'm called to plant a church in central Arlington, I'm going to tell you, somebody lied to you. I know my calling, though. This is what I'm called to do. So when people say, you're a great communicator, you need to travel and speak, I say, that's not what God called me to do right now. Hey, but you need to go plant a church here. You need to go do this. You need to go do that. Guess what? This is my calling. I have a boundary around this. Unless God calls me otherwise, I'm not going to do that. And here's the thing. Because I have a healthy relationship with the Holy Spirit, I know the boundaries of my calling. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament was facing this exact same thing. In Acts 16, excuse me, Acts 16, he is having this uh, conundrum on the inside. He believes that the people of Asia need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he wants to go to Asia, but here's what it says in verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. In other words, the Holy Spirit was saying, I've got boundaries around your calling. You're not called to go to Asia right now. One day you might, but right now it's not your day. That's for somebody else. So then the question is, if I'm called to these people that are in my realm of influence today, what do I do about everybody else? You pray that the people you're sitting around today would answer the call of Jesus to influence the people in their realm of influence. We pray, oh, this is heavenly right here. We pray for the wrong thing when we pray for other people's salvation. 
What we need to be praying is that people who are already saved would answer the call to minister to those who need salvation. I felt the Holy Ghost on that. Uh, Number four, I need to put boundaries around my money. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. In my household, we have created, clarified, and communicated boundaries around our money. We have a big boundary called a budget. We tell our money what to do every single month. The biggest boundary we have around our money is that no matter if there is a month of lack, if there is a month of I've got to work an extra job, or if there is a month of abundance, God gets our tithe, period, amen. We believe so strongly in that. It does not matter what kind of month we're going to have. If we got to cut back on eating out, cut back on groceries, cut back on this or that, it's okay because God is going to get our 10% because we want to be in covenant with him. We believe that God loves us. And so as a church, God has called us to bring 10% of our gross income. So my wife and I, we put a boundary around it. We said, we're going to do that. A lot of you, you don't have boundaries around your money. When people ask us for money, can I tell you something? Because we put a boundary around our money, if you ask me for money personally today, I'm gonna sit down with you. I'm gonna say, okay, let's talk about how you use your money. Because giving money to someone who is not wise with money is like giving a drug to a drug addict. It's like giving a drink to a drunk. You don't do it. You don't enable people who are unhealthy with money. Here's what I've learned. If I become the person who just gives money away because people demand it of me, then when the Holy Spirit is, instructs me to give to someone who is really in need, who he really needs to bless, I ain't got no money left because I gave it to my, well, I won't say who, but I gave it to somebody who is not wise with money. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? So I have to have a boundary around my money. Number five, I have a, a boundary around my family. I love people, but there are some people you're not allowed around my wife or my children. I don't allow my daughter to spend time with people I don't know. Proverbs 22.6 says, start a child off on the way they should go, and even when they're old, they won't depart from it. Part of being a parent, uh, if you have kids, you, you, you should realize this, that part of being a parent is creating boundaries around your children until they are wise enough to identify the boundaries for themselves. I don't let my daughter teach me that she's a puppy. Because right now she's going through this weird phase where she wants to be a puppy. And guess what? It's cute for about five minutes. But if I allow that to go on too long, I have a 24-year-old daughter who is living in a doghouse in the backyard because... No one ever taught her some boundaries for her identity. No one ever taught her boundaries of imagination And so as a parent, I have boundaries. I have boundaries around my wife. We don't allow people into our home with alcohol. We don't drink in our home. That's our personal choice. If you do, we're not judging or anything, but that's just what our personal choice is. So when people want to come over, that's fine, but we're not going to have alcohol for you, and please don't bring any. When people come over to our house, you cannot cuss in our house. You cuss, you out. Because I'm not going to have somebody cussing at my wife. And by the way, you try to cuss out my wife, you will feel the wrath. (laughs) I have boundaries around my wife. Guess what? My wife and I, we don't spend time with family members or friends who talk down to her. We don't spend time with family or friends who are negative at her. One of the boundaries that I put around my wife, and we had this healthy conversation uh, when she was first pregnant uh, with our first child, and we said, hey, uh, I said, look, I love you, but I, 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 I've known people for a long time. I'm a human expert now. I said, I'm asking you to withhold your time from the people who will talk to you about how horrible pregnancy is, about how birth is horrible, about how you're going to be sick all the time. I don't want you to spend time with those women who all they do is complain about their kids and how motherhood is horrible, you're gonna have a boundary around you because we're gonna hear happy, healthy things. We're gonna hear people who are investing life into you. And guess what? My wife had the best pregnancy of her life. She wants to be pregnant nonstop all the time. Y'all pray for me. (laughs) Because as a husband, I'm called in Ephesians 5 to love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
See, I'm going to give myself up for my wife to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water of the word. In other words, I'm going to make sure that she is, uh, has life spoken over her, not death spoken over her. I'm going to make sure that people are investing in her. And men, if you're married, let me tell you something. If you refuse to cut those people out of your life who would degrade your wife, who would talk down to your children, who would hurt your family, it's probably because somebody snipped something off of you and you need to grow them back real quick and you need to be a husband and a father. Serious. Last thing is, you need to put a boundary around, you need to put a boundary around your time. You need to put a boundary around your time. I think one of the worst things we decide as a, as a follower of Jesus to do is give ourselves completely to those who want to know Jesus. We don't put boundaries around our time, and what happens is people begin to empty us out. I love Proverbs 25, 17. It's probably the funniest verse in all of the Bible. If you can find a funnier one, let me know, but this one says this. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, too much of you, and they will hate you. <laughs> if that ain't a good rule of life, I don't know what is. You ever had that friend that comes over for dinner at 6 o'clock? And 11.30, they're still trying to hang out? I'm just trying to be down, dude. Well, be down at your own house. It's time for bed. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, lest you stay too long and they start to hate you. But you know, I've learned this as a pastor. When we were first starting the church, I would give myself to everybody who wanted my attention. Pastor, I need help. Pastor, I need prayer. Pastor, I need counseling. Pastor, I need therapy. Pastor, I need finances. Pastor, I need you. Pastor, I need you. And what started to happen is I was pouring myself out constantly, but then I was on empty for my wife. I was on empty for Jesus. And I would become irritated. And next thing I know, the same love that I had for people one week was gone the next week because I always knew when I saw that one person they were going to try to consume every part of me. You see, but Stephen, as a follower of Jesus, aren't you supposed to give yourself fully to people? No, because Jesus didn't do that. When you go study the life of Jesus, Jesus withdrew from the crowds many times to be with his father. Because the more that you pour yourself out, the emptier you become, and the emptier you become, the more you will hate those whom you have poured out on. You have to be refilled over and over. I've set boundaries on my time. I do not respond to text messages all the time anymore. There are some people who got blocked. And yes, they go to this church. Because they would not respect the boundary. Hey, you cannot text me any moment of any day. I have a new definition of emergency as a pastor. Emergency for me is life or death. Period. Amen. Amen. Because what most people consider emergencies aren't emergencies. If you call me up at 11 o'clock and say, hey, my husband's leaving me and he hates me and he told me that he's taking the kids and he's out of here. It's an emergency. I need your help. There's nothing I can do. Because husbands don't wake up at 11 o'clock from a nightmare and go, oh my gosh, I need to take my kids and get out of the house. I hate you and I want to divorce you right now. No, that was months and months and months and months of chaos that led to that point. It's not an emergency. And so I've put this definition Emergencies are life or death situations. You're going to the hospital, you need prayer, absolutely call me. My child got hit by a car, absolutely call me. But I cannot give myself to everyone and pour myself out on everyone 24-7 and still be a healthy, happy husband or father. It would get to the point where I would hate my own church. It would get to the point where because I'm pouring myself out all the time and I'm attaching myself to every person because they all have my time, that I would never get to actually study the Bible and teach you what the Word of God says. Instead, I'd show up on a Sunday and be like, I don't care. You guys suck. You're all going to hell anyway. <laughs> it's not like you listen to what I say anyway. I say, take notes. What do you do? You stare at me. <laughs> I say, take notes. What do you do? You go to sleep. I say, turn to your neighbor, and you're like, I don't like my neighbor. I'm not turning to them. We ask you to give. What do you do? You complain because we ask you to give. We ask you to serve. You complain. I would literally get to that point. You know how I know? Because I've met pastors who do that. So I don't give my time away to everybody. But here's the biggest element of restricting time from people that I've learned. I give set amounts of time to people who need Jesus 
Because when I give them that time, that time is a healthy investment to point them back to Jesus. So now when people say, Pastor Stephen, there's a problem, I need prayer. I'll say, cool, call me in about two hours. If they call me in two hours, guess what they wanted? Prayer. They don't call me back, guess what they didn't want? Prayer. They call me, I get on the phone with them, I say, okay, man, I got time for you, what's going on? Here's the situation, blah, 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 and they just hit me with it real quick. Here's what I do, awesome, let's pray about it right now. And I pray a prayer of faith. I don't pray, God, we hope you're listening. We hope you'll answer this prayer today. I say, in the name of Jesus, we just rebuke every attack of the enemy. We thank you that by Jesus' stripes, you are healed. We thank you, you are the head and not the tail in Jesus' name. You abide in Christ Jesus. There is now no condemnation for those who are in. I'll preach, I will pray your face off over the phone. And then guess what I do? Okay, here's the thing. I'm not gonna be able to be in contact with you for a couple days, I got a lot going on. Here's what I want you to do. When you wake up next morning, you pray that exact same prayer. Everything I just said, you say it word for word. Before you go to bed, you pray. Anytime you're thinking negatively about this situation we just prayed about, you pray that exact prayer. Now, here's what people do. But, Stephen, you're a pastor. You're supposed to love people. I am loving people by setting a boundary around my time. Because the more that people get your time, the less they want of God's time. And if I don't teach people that the same God that answers my prayers loves them enough to answer their prayers, they'll always think that I have some kind of magical prayer. But because I put a boundary around my time, I point them back to Jesus. I train them to go back to God and pray those prayers and believe in him and have faith. And then I'll check in every so often. Here's what that does. It allows me to be healthy because I'm living out what Jesus did. It helps me not build walls up so that I'm like, I don't want anything to do with people anymore. And instead, I'm focused on being a healthy husband, a healthy a father, a healthy pastor, a healthy follower of Jesus. Because when I'm healthy, here's the thing, unhealthy people are attracted to healthiness. Unhealthy people are attracted to healthiness. Here's how I know. Because again, I'm a human expert. Anytime there is a new trend in a diet, all us overweight, we don't feel good, we eat too many cookies, go to that diet for a season. And we're going to lose 5 pounds, 10 pounds, 15 pounds. Okay? Then what do we do? We get on Instagram and we start looking at all the people with perfect bodies that have been airbrushed in Photoshop that have $100,000 a year to pay a professional nutritionist to pick out all of their meals. That all they do because they hate themselves... They say no to carbs completely. They basically just eat leaves and that's it and drink water. <laughs> and we go, I want to be in that bikini because they're a size negative three. <laughs> Honey, you have not been a size negative three since you were six years old. God made you a size seven for a reason. Just admit you got the cushion and it's good. It's okay. <laughs> But we think to ourselves, I'm unhealthy, so I'm going to go observe what healthy, healthy people are doing, and I'm going to try it. Well, can I tell you something? That's the wrong theory to have in a relationship with Jesus. Jesus ain't no diet. He's not ketogenic. He is not Mr. Atkin. He is not paleo nothing. Jesus is not a diet that you try. Jesus is a lifestyle that you submit to. Because when you submit to Jesus, he can make you healthy. So here's what people do. They go, Stephen, how are you so happy? How does your wife still love you after only seven years? Because I got divorced in the first year and a half. Why does your daughter not run around the church like crazy? Why does she not need a whooping every five seconds like my child? How do you do that? Here's what I tell them. Jesus. Jesus. Whatever healthiness you see in me, it wasn't because of anything I did. The grace of God is not accessible because I did the right things. The grace of God within me transformed me to want to do the right things. The grace of God pulled me closer to Jesus, so I have become healthier over time. Now, I want, it, I want you to hear me. I don't care if you've been divorced. I don't care if your kids are running around crazy. What, I, what I'm trying to get you to understand, though, is as you create boundaries around your life, as you create boundaries around relationships, as you create boundaries around your faith and your lifestyle, what starts to happen is you get healthier because you're drawn more to Jesus. And when unhealthy people see health in you, they want to know what made you so healthy? 
and your response is Jesus. That church, revived church, that is how we, in a healthy way, introduce real people to the real Jesus.